Raidīja raksts drošinātājs. Hello, Jussi. Hello. Let me start with a provocative question. Why at the time of war, when Ukrainians are fighting for survival of their country, should we care about startup scene in Ukraine? I think it's different layers. First is, of course, all the Europeans, we should help Ukraine at the moment during this crisis. And then second, the sort of rebuilding phase of Ukraine has started already before the war is ending. So if you are not there now, it's too late when the, all the opportunistic people come after the war. And then uh, thirdly, uh, I would say that the Ukrainian startup ecosystem is so strong. So it's a really good good reason for investors to invest in Ukraine in overall, mm-hmm. if not during the war, but also after the war. We will go into more detail a bit later about specifics, but uh, before that, could you just give us a quick overview of uh, the startup scene in Ukraine? There was some U.S. research about from which countries come the most of the unicorn founders. And Ukraine is in the top levels in that sense. WhatsApp founder, as an example, one of the founders. It's a really good scheme in that sense that uh, there is a lot of like education for software development in Ukraine. And it's one of the biggest or even the biggest software outsourcing country at the moment in Europe. So many, many good reasons, because then, of course, uh, the most scalable startups are more more or less software-based. So there are a lot of uh, good entrepreneurs, and they are really hardworking people in Ukraine. And then, to add on that, there is a really good and active uh, startup ecosystem building and good events and so on. So could you just tell me a bit more about your involvement in all of this? When the war started, I was in Portugal, got a call, you said, should we do something? And I I immediately said yes. So something touched my heart when the war started. I have to do something. Then I was founding this help center for Ukrainians in Helsinki, helping uh, Ukrainian army and also getting jobs to Ukrainians entering Finland, (laughs) getting food for Ukrainians coming to Finland. All of that kind of things. And then after that, I got invited to a startup competition jury, becoming a jury member in a startup competition because my work is is evaluating startups. So it was natural. And uh, then because of that, I got invitation to IT Arena and, uh, last year and uh, I organized the first Bridge of Trust event, which is basically bridging trust between uh, investors and uh, Ukrainian startups. Sort of the voluntary work became like real stuff <laughs> during the process. And then I was organizing second uh, Bridge of Trust during Slosh, which is the biggest uh, startup event in the world. It was success as well. So we d- decided with cooperation with European Business Angel Network, Latvian, Lithuanian, Estonian, Finnish Business Angel Networks to organize the latest one. And uh, now it seems that the voluntary work is becoming an organization. So next steps during the next next slush, we will sort of uh, have a founding meeting of the Bridge of Trust organization. So the voluntary work becoming a real organization. What is your background in the startup community? I was a founder of Balance, which was a startup for personal finance management. I founded it in 2008. And since that, I've been uh, helping uh, as an advisor or every possible role, Finnish startups, uh, so 18 years now. And um, I would say that I'm one of the most networked Finns in the startup ecosystem. And uh, I'm also like a VC founder, Liquida.vc, which is then uh, seeking for the best startups to invest You dropped some names uh, of the events that uh, from uh, that community know and don't need any introduction, but for for our audience who might not be as knowledgeable in the startup uh, scene, could you just uh, tell us what is, uh, you said, IT Arena, you said Slush is the biggest one for startups in the world, and then you said Bridge of Trust. Could you just uh, very briefly, just to give us the background? 
Okay, of course, Fluff it has been growing fast and it's now the biggest uh, startup event in the world. And it takes place in Finland, yeah? Helsinki, yeah, Helsinki, Finland. November, like something like 20th of November this year. And I think it's sold out already. But but anyways, then IT Arena is sort of the Eastern European version of Slush. It was like 5,000 people now this year, and it was uh, organized 11th time. IT Arena is a technology conference where it's also a startup track, and we were on the startup track. And then we organized this Bridge of Trust as a side event of those both uh, Slush and, and then IT Arena three times now. Uh, so, but the Bridge of Trust is for Ukrainian startups and international investors. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, that's correct. But we're sort of uh, building a platform for overall uh, networking in Baltics, Nordics, Czech Republic, Poland, Ukraine. But now we are first focusing, of course, to the Ukrainian startup ecosystem because it's sort of then helping also the country westernize itself and so on in one of the interviews you've said uh, at the moment in the bridge of trust the most important emphasis is on building trust rather than to find immediate funding or um... exactly and what do you mean by that <laughs> because you don't do investments into companies that you don't have some kind of a breaching of trust element in the background. So it's really diff- difficult to do cross-border investments if you don't have like someone that is uh, recommending the company or having some kind of shared connections and so on with the startup. So that's why we do this long term. We want to build a trust network, basically. And then through that comes investments as well. Actually, uh, one of the winners of the startup competition that we organized in that uh, we heard that they already got funding bridge of trust event so and we are also uh, calculating this and doing some metrics for that i think we will uh, ask all the investors after six months that how many euros did you actually invest we continue developing this platform so it will be i hope it will be evolving uh, dozens of years instead of just one event or two events and so on. So there there have been three Bridge of Trust events, right, so far? Yeah. yeah. One in Slavs and two in uh, ITRN. And how has been this experience like? Have you achieved uh, what you set out to do or is it just the first baby steps and how has been this experience for you? Uh, it was huge because uh, lots of media coverage through the event. Then it was full sold out one week before already and actually there were 50 to 100 people trying to <laughs> come in without the invitation so it was a mess in the starting phase then of course in the panel discussion having Serhi Pritula some people talk that uh, he might be the next president of Ukraine and this level of people joining us and supporting us is huge 30 different partners Finnish Ministry for Foreign Affairs and so on. For our listeners, uh, just uh, for them to know, Serhi Pritula is a Ukrainian uh, TV personality and he has been very involved in fundraising millions of euros for Ukrainian military. And As an example, 18,000 drones for the Ukrainian army. So he he's a national hero. So, but tell us what you saw there. You said... Before the war, Ukraine was known for bright minds and great ideas in startup scene internationally. But for the third year, the war is going on. How has it affected the the whole scene in Ukraine? Is there anyone left in Ukraine or uh, the brightest minds have left the country and uh, doing their thing already abroad? Of course, that has been happening as well. But I think in general, the startups have been doing this, that they have some other legal entity in some other country in Europe. So many of them have have some, and this is making the investments also easier if it's, for instance, they have uh, offices in the Netherlands, Finland, uh, Sweden, Spain, Portugal, all of them, and Poland, of course. So that's one effect that has happened. But then... Uh, They also want to build the country, so they want to keep it alive and uh, healthy. And and they, of course, the effects, there are some uh, 
side effects of a war. <laughs> so, for instance, people have been moving a lot to the western side of Ukraine, having offices in Lviv, Kiev, as an example. Then, of course, the army is recruiting people, so it affects uh, through that as well. What else would I list? I think that the positive side effect is that they are have, have becoming more international and having more support from outside of Ukraine. Investors seeking for ways to help and invest at the same time. Because of the war, some changes that would have, have uh, taken a long, long time are taking place much quicker. In the startup scene, I, as I understand from what you said, that also the the changes for better in that exact sector have been faster than they would be otherwise. Is that correct assumption? Yes, that's really, really correct. Did you know that also our event was sort of uh, in the middle of uh, this information campaign? Yeah, I, I read about that and I wanted to <laughs> ask you, and I think that's a compliment for an for, for event like that, that uh, even uh, trolls and stuff like that are putting attention to you. But could you just uh, tell our audience what happened? Yes, I was having a summer vacation and I started to get messages from our partners that, hey, we got this kind of an email, which was sort of signed by Ukrainian government. <laughs> and it was not, of course. And uh, there was this story was that we are Russians, basically. Liquido, the, the founder of which I am, uh, we have, have Russians uh, as founders and we have strong connections with Russian government and of course i was laughing at the first because i'm a total Finn, and we all are and we are supporting ukraine we have done that during uh, during these years and in finland all of the people know it but of course our uh, ukrainian and other international partners started to ask like these questions that what is this <laughs> and then we ended up into the biggest finnish media digital media iltalehti and and third biggest Keski-Suoma in Finland and, and got it sort of corrected right away. And we lost zero partners because of this. We have also strong support. Ministry for Foreign Affairs of Finland is supporting <laughs> these right. actions. So, so it was a bit easier because we had those big brands uh, supporting us. But what does it tell you that there has been this sort of action against you? personally and against a, an event, I guess. I think we have been enough in the talks, doing something significant enough to get this kind of uh, audience, that uh, audience of trolls and so on. So I think it's a positive sign. But still then, uh, for people who are not uh, directly connected with the startup scene, so what has been the most significant achievement of this project of uh, the Bridge of Trust? There are just three events... Okay, somebody maybe have had already some first investments, but otherwise it's just a few events, few startups, few investors. What's the big deal about that? Someone could ask. Yeah, good question. Actually, to be honest, I think the biggest influence and success was to find the local uses from different countries. So I, I found many investors who were sort of the local heroes in building uh, same kind of stuff that I have been building from Finland. So I from Poland, actually two guys from Poland that, that I, I'm now having sort of the local heroes that can support us to grow. I found people from Czech Republic. I found people from Latvia, many, many actually from Latvia. I, I'm really proud of, proud of that. From Estonia, from Lithuania, from Portugal, Spain, Germany, France, I don't remember all the countries, US, UK. So I think the biggest uh, success was to find those people to join us because now we can grow like locally in those countries and organize amazing things together with them and make it, make it grow basically. Are we talking about helping grow Ukrainian startups or helping grow new network of uh, startups uh, in this region? Uh, yes, we are doing a sort of both. So the main focus area is to support Ukraine and Ukrainian startup ecosystem. 
for sure, because the background is such that it uh, happened to us because of the war. But then later, of course, we are then cross preaching all of those different countries and uh, startup ecosystems wh- while doing the help of Ukraine. So basically, it's open for all the startups in this region. But, you know, when you set out to do something, there are some large goals, small goals and stuff like that. What would bring you the most joy when you can come to a point and say, yeah, well, we basically achieved what we wanted to achieve? Do you have such goals? Yes, I do personally, of course, really clear goals. But we also need people to support us. So basically, we are now collecting some key players from each country to visit Slush and and Helsinki next month on November, end of November. And uh, but my biggest goal is become the biggest like network of of investors, VCs, family offices, and business angels that will be then cross-bridging trust and then through that becoming the biggest uh, player in this field in a couple of years. It takes more time because, for instance, IT Arena was founding, founded 11 years ago, Slush almost 20 years ago, and so on. But I think we have a pretty clear agenda. I'm giving you an example. Family offices, many times, they are not that well networked. What do you mean by family offices? Like families investing. So business angel is a private person, but then family office, offices normally have a bit bigger money to spend on investments. And then we have venture capital companies, VCs. So we are connecting all of them instead of just business angels or just family offices or just VCs. And this is what makes us maybe a bit special in Europe. So, and basically at first uh, you invite them and ask them to look at what the Ukrainian startup scene can offer. And then it's, you know, just naturally grows into a discussion. Oh, what's actually in this geographical area uh, besides Ukraine is... Yes, that's really well put. It's always when people have... Uh, strong uh, trust between themselves, like investors. They are then sharing the their portfolio companies and their deal flow to each other. So basically, we are growing a big deal flow for the investors joining because then they have network better networks in each countries. This is what happens in the background. So if you know someone, then that, that someone from that market will find you good cases to invest also in the future, not just in the events, because events are just connecting people, but the connections will then make the big difference when you have this this trust trust, uh, people around you. When we talk about different investors, is there a one thing that brings them together in the bridge of trust? Is it the fact that they want to help somehow Ukraine? Or is it that their business senses say, that I must be there because when the war will be over, there's going to be huge opportunities. What are those aspects, in your view, that uh, bring people to your event, the Bridge of Trust? I think the first thing is that all of us, first, we didn't think about any business opportunities. When the war started, I haven't at least seen anyone that would be so opportunistic, that would have been right away thinking about some uh, later like success investments or something we basically wanted just to help ukraine we saw that the country was struggling and we wanted to help but then later phases people start to know more hey ukrainian startup ecosystem is actually really good investment wise there is uh, the valuations for instance in the early phase they are lower than in Finland, as an example. And then the rebuilding phase, of course, that uh, makes us think that, of course, there will be a lot of money investment investments into different industries in Ukraine. So that's also now becoming sort of more like also thinking about from business point of view and then investments point of view. But I think the origin of all 
have, have been the same in, in different countries when these people started to think how through them, their professions they could help Ukraine. You mentioned that uh, there is also an interest from Latvian investors joining you. How did the Latvians uh, find you or you found them and uh, what uh, brings them to your table? Yes, uh, Egita Polanska is the name of the, the person that I was inviting already to slosh, I think. And Egita then uh, was organizing a trip to IT Arena and then, then there came like 20 plus <laughs> investors from Latvia. But this is all about the escalation I want to do in different countries. Finding those right people who are the most net networked guys in their own countries and who share this passion to help Ukraine. And when you find those, then they will be the bridges of trust sort of locally and uh, seeking for us more investors and investments through that. And uh, if uh, there are some Latvian investors listening to you right now, what be your very short pitch to them why they should p uh, put attention to Ukraine during the war? Yeah, in investing, deal flow is everything. That's what I always say. So you have to have uh, plenty of companies to go through to find the best investment opportunities. So basically, through breach of trust, you get that better deal flow. Now let's talk about the spheres of a startup uh, scene where Ukraine is stronger than others. If we look at the army, let's say, you don't have to be a military expert to understand that because of the war, because of the situation Ukraine has been put in, that they don't receive uh, the, uh, the weapons they need, they need to go do something about that themselves. And the result has been that they have, I'm pretty sure that after the end of the war, Ukraine is going to be the like in top three country in the world if we talk about drones. And that's the result of necessity. When we talk about startup scene, has war influenced maybe what they do? If we abstract from the war, what are the like the best uh, areas that um, you see the brightest uh, examples or biggest potential? I also visited one drone factory during the visit to Lviv uh, three weeks ago. And many of those companies just didn't exist before the war. So there are, there are multiple of defense tech and dual use technology companies that have been founded because of the war. And of course, the, the war gives the special possibility opportunities for for testing in real time of the solution. So basically they're developed in the market, which is sort of there. If you are having some defense tech company and you, you want to test it, of course you have to have a war to test it, basically. So th that's for sure the, the one of, number one sort of top pick, uh, I would say, from the startup scheme. But then health tech is another example because all of the solutions to, for instance, train the army with some AR solutions and those kind of solutions I've seen a lot. I would say health tech and, and defense tech would be the most obvious ones. Uh, but also others, um, educational technologies, they have this for army use, for, for instance, different kinds of solutions for also the recovering soldiers, psychological uh, solutions. So this is a bit like health tech area as well. I don't know. I haven't been actually thinking that much because we sort of don't have any industry specific focus. We are seeking for the best startups in any fields. When you talk to Ukrainians, you realize that the way they see the life after a few years of war is quite different from those who read about the war just in news. You know that it's not uh, definite that tomorrow will come. And that's sad, but at the same time, there are people who are living the life more vitally, if that's the correct word. If you want to get married, let's get married, because in a year or in a month, maybe we will not have this chance. I just wanted to ask you, in your field, in the startup scene, when you meet with those very entrepreneurial Ukrainians who want to do something with their life, who have ideas, who want to grow them, 
do they differ from, let's say, startup guys in Finland? Yes. Uh, first, I have to say the resilience of the startups in Ukraine. You are always seeking for resilient uh, entrepreneurs. But these guys who are <laughs> having that much of le stress levels that they can handle both founding a company without the funding and then having a war in the country at the same time. So these uh, make the diamonds. One of the biggest things is that, that they have more ambitious um, goals because they don't see only the home country to be the place to be. And they are seeking for opportunities abroad more than, for, for instance, Finnish startups in the first phase. So they have these side offices somewhere in other countries already. They uh, seek for opportunities uh, more from abroad and these kind of effects, I would say. Because sort of the home market is not there. So Ukrainians are more ambitious than Finns. We can cut this off, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You said when the war started, you immediately understood that you want to help Ukraine in any way or somehow. Yeah. Why is that? What was the reason for you personally? I have been trying to find the right reason. But I think it's partly because... In our family, we saw all those documentaries about Second World War and Nazis killing Jews and so on. So I think that's part of the story that I have been, when I was a little kid, I was always wondering how in earth these people in Europe didn't help the Jews. How is it possible? And how would I act if something similar would happen in my life? And, and that never thought that it would happen, happen anymore. But for me, I think personally, this was the button was clicked in me. To act now or you don't have any similar opportunities within your lifetime to do something so significant. And what have you learned about yourself, about the world as such, or your country, or your friends, uh, or Ukrainians? What have you learned during these two and a half, almost three years of war, by being actively involved at first in helping uh, Ukrainians in Finland, then going to Ukraine and trying to what you do best, are there any lessons from this experience or <laughs> of course. what have you taken from this? I knew what kind of a person I become in uh, when this kind of uh, crisis happens. I'm one of those people that have to act. We have different kinds of people that some don't want to even follow the war news and all of that. But I learned that from myself. Also divorced because of this happening, what happened to me, and uh, learned also that when I have a passion to do something, I can do pretty nice things. I also learned that many of the voluntary people are actually super nice people, uh, capable of doing amazing things. Finding those people has been maybe the most valuable asset for me personally so far. Learning also that people become pa more passive uh, when the war continues. Some news don't cover anymore Ukrainian war the same way it covered uh, in the first phases of the war. Lots of learnings how to build uh, the relevant, uh, trustworthy media coverage to follow the war. I would say that normally the typical big news companies, they are late. Things have happened already five days before they are in the newspapers. And also understanding personally that how big effect voluntary organizations and their, their help, beginning of the war as an example, they are much uh, faster in, in providing the help than the national level players' actions. So the political system is slow, but people are fast. Thank you for what you're doing and thank you for explaining about uh, this um, part of um, Ukrainian story that we actually haven't heard before. I want to say one thing for all the Latvians listening. Be proud of yourself. Because you are one of the countries that has been supporting and really supporting 
at least my actions to help Ukraine. Amazing people that I have met. So big, big hearts to all the veterans. Okay, kiitos. <laughs> Ole hyvä. Raidiraksts drošinātājs. Paldies dīvam par saru no ar investoru Jussi Mūrikainē. Nu jā, nu šī laikam ir kārtējā reize, kad izlasot, noklausoties šo interviju, man atkal ataust atmiņā un domās tas, cik tomēr šis kara laiks ir savā veidā arī izdevīgs laiks dažādām inovācijām. Un mēs runājam ne tikai par militāro nozari, kur dažādas jaunas tehnoloģijas var izdomāt, Būtībā Ukraina ir spiesti izdomāt gan pati, gan kopā ar partneriem, un tas pats jau attiecas arī ne tikai uz militāro nozari un uz kādiem jauniem ieročiem vai tehnoloģijām, bet arī uz jebkurām citām nozarēm, jo Ukraina ir spiesti izdzīvot, spiesti pielāgoties, un tas spiež meklēt jaunas risinājumus, jaunas idejas ģenerēt, un man šķiet, ka nu, šis ir viens no tiem piemēriem, kā sanāk kopā tie, kam ir nauda un tiem, kam ir idejas, un tad jau arī top kaut kas labs un nodarīgs ne tikai pašai Ukrainai, bet nu, pēc tam noteikti arī citiem, citām valstīm un arī kā eksportu preci noteikti Ukrainai. Tieši tā, un Es esmu visai pārliecināts, ka neviens vien jaunuzņēmums, kurš ir saticis savus nākamos investorus Jussi rīkotajā The Bridge of Trust pasākumā vai vienalga kā viņi tur tālāk attīstīsies vai kļūst par organizāciju vai par uzņēmumu, ka noteikti pēc gadiem mēs dzirdēsim, ka tātad šie te, šie te pirmie kontakti starp viedajiem prātiem un naudas turētājiem ir notikus tieši kādā no jūsī rīkotajiem pasākumiem, tātad kā jau epizodes sākumā minēju, ir neviens vien visā pasaulē ļoti labi zināms jaunuzņēmums, kas sāc savu darbību Ukrainā un strauji izplaties pasaulē, tā kā lai izdodas Ukraiņiem arī šajā ziņā, tas noteikti nāk par labu arī valsts ekonomikai un visam pārējiem, un, un protams, tad, kad karš būs beidzies, tad atkritīs daudz, daudzi šķēršļi, kas šobrīd, protams, buksē jebkuru jomu Ukrainā. Cerams, Ukraiņi, arī Ukraiņas jaunuzņēmumi varēs ar jaunu jaudu darboties, kad šis te Krievijas izvērstais noziedzīgais karš būs beidzies. Tas šai reizei arī viss, um, nē, nav viss. <laughs> ja, es domāju, ka Ja jums šī intervija šķita interesanta vai svarīga, padalieties ar to, ieliecēt kur nu kurā platformā, kas pienāks vai tur īkšķīši vai zvaigznītes vai atsauksmas. Jā, atsauksmas droši rakstiet, tās mēs arī lasam. Var tur pat pie epizodēm, piemēram, radio mājas lapā rakstīt vai arī varat mums sūtīt epas uz drošinātājs at Latvijas radio LV izlasām. Tos noteikti, kā dzirdējāt arī Kristīnas sarunā, klausītājs jautājums tiek iekļauts. Ja jums ir kādas idejas, kādas vēl tēmas jūs gribētu dzirdēt mūsu apskatām vai uzrunājam cilvēkus par kādām konkrētām tēmām, tad arī rakstiet mums, dodiet idejas. Mēs jau 88. reizi piedāvājam jums šīs te lielās intervijas par visdažādākajām tēmām, kas saistītas ar Ukrainas cīņu par izdzīvošanu. Un nekad neviena ideja nenāk par ļaunu, ātrāk vai vēlāk to mēs noteikti varam realizēt. Bet, jā, tas šai reizē viss. Interviju, kā vienmēr var nedēļas nogalē LSMLV atrast rakstītā veidā, un tur arī fotogrāfijas klāt pievienotas. Bet mēs tiekamies ar tevi, Rihardu, un ar klausītājiem pēc nedēļas jau nākamajā ceturtdienā, kad Raidierakst platformās iznāks jau 89. drošinātā epizoda vai piekdienās 18.15 Latvijas radio pirmajā kanālā, kur ir drošinātāja koncentrēta versija dzirdama. Jā, nu šajā reizē tas arī viss, es arī no jums atvados un nākamajā reizē jau noteikti būs gan daudz jārunā par ASA vēlēšanām, bet nu sakojam līdz ne tikai ASV vēlēšanām, protams, turpinām sakot un turpinām arī atbalstīt Ukrainu un noteikti to darīsim arī mēs, kad atgriezīsimies jau ar nākamo epizodu jauniem stāstiem jaunu analīzi. Tieši tā, un atcerieties. Drošinātājs, tas ir skaidri un personīgi par kā Ukrainā. Raidīraksts Drošinātājs.